Welcome to number 38. And this is a really interesting uh, topic. This is the time course to loss of consciousness. Um, thank you to all the patrons that uh, asked to do this. I think there were a number of you and it's been such a busy last couple of weeks, obviously trying to get the, um, the last trainees from the last sitting through. So it's been really good to sort of get this done uh, for, uh, for this sitting. And for those of you who have just recently joined, the whole idea of this uh, program is just to provide a framework that aims to stimulate the way that you think and release adrenaline, get you excited, and that helps you to facilitate attention to detail and assist your brain in creating long-term memory. Now, why Patreon? So, um, just helps keep me motivated and keeps me keeps me sort of going in in terms of um, just the energy so that you know I can provide like a product and a service that's of value to you and you know I just want to have everyone here have a positive growth mindset I want to help you excel in the ANSCA primary exam and in return allows me to support activities that are also committed to positive growth so those include primarily the ANSCA Research Foundation but also other charitable organizations and you can see who I donate on my Instagram page at the end of each month. Now with the breakdown of the SAQs as always we're going to review the examiner's report, uh, look at the literature, I'm going to present some key concepts, answer any questions that you might have and then I'll show you an answer structure before we all have a go at writing an answer to time. This is the 2020 question 13. And it is describe the time course between an intravenous injection of a general anesthetic agent to loss of consciousness. Explain the delay using pharmacokinetic principles. This is the examiner's report. So I've just highlighted the ones that I think are important, I've highlighted in green, the ones that we should try to avoid or um, try to think about, I've highlighted in red. Um, and the ones in neutral, I've just left it in black. So the question had two parts. One asking about the time course between an intravenous injection of anesthetic agent to loss of consciousness. The other asking to use pharmacokinetic principles. The domains covered were the concept of the effect site and determining KEO, factors which contribute to the change in plasma concentration over time, diffusion, and to a lesser extent, effect site changes that result in loss of consciousness. For example, receptor binding activation and change of resting membrane potential. The reason why this is um, to a lesser extent is that this is primarily pharmacodynamics. And I think uh, just knowing that and knowing that the question was asking about pharmacokinetic principles, we don't want to spend sort of too long um, sort of discussing that idea. Now, many candidates simply stated fixed law of diffusion and discuss the factors responsible for a drug moving across a plasma membrane with no mention of pharmacokinetic principles. A description of the role of the effect site equilibration rate constant, in other words, KEO, and equilibration half-life, T half KEO, in the delay in onset was expected. Candidates mentioned KEO with a brief definition, um, but very few were able to give explanations about why drug factor altered the constant or how differing intravenous agents differ in their equilibrium, in equilibrium half-life that led to different onset times. Those who could generally did very well. Discussions about absorptions were superfluous for, a, for an intravenous agent. Likewise, lengthy discussions about metabolism when discussing time to loss of consciousness were unnecessary. So we just need to make a note of that um, because I think that a lot of candidates would have put in the ADME uh, structure, which is absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and certainly absorption, um, metabolism, and even excretion is, mm, we'll, we'll talk about it, but uh, less important for bolus dosing. 
Now, a good reference is provided in Pharmacology and Physiology for Anesthesia, Hemmings and Egan, Chapter 2. And that is the one of the core references uh, that we're going to use today, because after all, we do want to understand what the examiner is asking and how they interpret the concepts. And the best way to do that is go straight to the source in which they are referring their questions from and getting their answers from. This is a summary of the exams report. So we need to talk about two things. We need to talk about the time course, and then we need to talk about the delay. And the time course will include factors that affect the plasma concentration over time, factors that affect the effect concentration over time, and that would include the ideas of KEO and the factors that affect KEO, which are primarily going to be diffusion, and talk about the concentration effect site changes. And when we go about and delve more into detail about the delay, we do need to uh, expand on the ideas of KEO and T half KEO. Now, this is a question I asked myself, why did so many candidates write about Fick's law of diffusion? And if you actually look at the references that I provide, they certainly do talk about diffusion, um, but they don't mention Fick's law uh, in detail or specifically. So all the references that I provide from Hemmings and Egan, Evers and Mays, um, in Millers, They've got, they've got the keyword diffusion there, but they don't have fixed law of diffusion. And I think it's because of a recent question from 2016, which is a very similar sort of question, um, which is asking to discuss the factors influencing the speed of onset of blockade of a major peripheral nerve with local anesthetic. And for that question there, uh, fixed law of diffusion was an important concept to talk about. So I think that, you know, with the keyword of onset of a drug, it's very natural um, for a trainee to immediately lean on to the idea of fixed law of diffusion. And I'll talk to you why in terms of it's not, um, it is important and it relates to it, but it's not all encompassing of the, of the components um, to explain the the time course as well as the delay. Now, this is the literature. So I've added them all onto the Patreon page um, and there is a lot to get through. And I don't expect all of you to read um, all the chapters as well as all the articles. It's more so just as a reference and you, you can just go over there and see where I've gotten my ideas from. So it's from Hemmings, Hemmings and Egan chapter two. Miller's chapter 18, Evers and May's chapter 61, which is really good for um, discussing about uh, how speed of injection affects onset. And then articles primarily by these two authors, Ludbrook and Upton. So they um, published many, many articles on physiological models um, of uh, IV induction agents. And I've also got an article by Epsilon just with TCI, just with some numbers there, okay? Now, the first thing we're gonna talk about is time course. And I think when we talk about time course, this is a really um, nice, simple way of thinking about this visually. So we've got the drug administration or represented by I and I uh, stands for initial and that heads into the V1 compartment. And from the V1 compartment, what happens is that you get a distribution, okay? And the most important one is going to be V2. V3 is probably uh, going to be significant more for sort of prolonged infusion. So we don't need to worry too much about that for bolus dosing. And then after that, we've got the idea that it has to head over to the effect site. And then the important idea about KEO, which we'll talk about. The other idea here is also that from the central compartment, this is where you get... Um, clearance, which is represented by the elimination rate constant K1O. And we'll have a discussion in terms of <laughs> how much of a role that actually plays uh, with bolus dosing. Now, I've just created a very simple diagram here. And this is just for bolus dosing. 
and the dose is represented by I. And then we've got plasma concentration in V1, which is represented by um, CPT to loss of consciousness. And what I have is that I've represented a distribution to the most important compartment, which is the rapidly equilibrating compartment. Um, and that's V2, and that's represented by K12. And then clearance is represented by the elimination rate constant K10. And then after that, we've got transfer to the biophase. Okay, so that's represented by K1E and then KEO. This, I think, is a really good idea um, from Hemmings and Egan. And what they have here is a nice visualization of the time course. And we've got the drug in the syringe, which is the dose. And so we give that. And that heads off into the bloodstream where you get plasma concentration. And then the third thing is that the drug starts acting at the target cells or the receptors. And that's where you get the effect site concentration. And then the fourth thing is that after it binds to the receptor, it starts interacting with it. And that's where you get the effect. So that's a really nice way to describe the time course of an IV induction agent. But there are many ways that you can actually talk about this. So you can also think about this in terms of this idea here which is the dose domain, the concentration domain, and the effect domain. And I think going into more detail where you, where you can look at it sort of down here, we've got the pharmacokinetics domain. So that's the dose concentration relationship. And you can see that that affects, or that is affected by both the dose and as well as what that occurs in the bloodstream. So that's a plasma concentration. And that can be explained with the pharmacokinetics. So in other words, the dose will affect the pharmacokinetics and that will in return, depending on um, all those ideas about distribution, that's gonna be affecting what the plasma concentration is going to be. And then the second thing, is that you can also think about it in terms of the biophase or the plasma effect relationship, which is determined by the plasma concentration and its relationship with the effect concentration. And then finally, we've got the pharmacodynamics, which is the idea of the concentration effect relationship. So that has to do with um, the concentration at the cells, at the target cells, okay? And then the effect that they produce. So you can see that there's actually multiple ways which you can actually describe the time course um, going from induction all the way to the effect. Now, this is a very nice uh, description here. And this is done sort of uh, graphically. And I'll just sort of go through what I mean. So we've got the concentration versus time graph here. Okay, so that's one. And, it, and initially, when you give a bolus of drug, your plasma concentration peaks. And then after that, it starts declining as per the poly exponential equation uh, here. Okay. And obviously, um, if it's a one compartment, it's going to be a mono exponential. Um, but often, we often think of it as a three compartment model. Over here, they've just defined it as a two compartment model. Okay, so initially for the first step, you got plasma concentration changing over time. The second step here is how the effect site concentration changes over time. So the only thing I have with this diagram is that it doesn't actually represent um, what is truly accurate. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, you've got sort of two peaks here that are occurring at the same time. And I would have preferred if they drew it very similar to the top one. So you get a bit of um, a consistency with the ideas. In other words, that with a bolus dose, it looks something like this. And then after that, with the effect site, you get something like this, okay? I think that will look 
a lot more accurate than than the one that this diagram has shown. So um, I think this diagram is just talking about the time lag. That's what they want to um, sort of want to sort of show you on this diagram through a very simplified idea. But the diagram which they've used is not totally correct. Okay, so just be aware. And then finally, we've got the idea of the effect site, and that's um, going to be graphically shown by this, uh, what they call the Emacs sigmoidal equation. And that's the idea of the relationship between, between concentration and being able to deliver a desired effect. Now, we can think of it, again, in terms of pharmacokinetics, the biophase or the transport to the biophase and pharmacodynamics. And you can see the formulas that are going to be determining the relationships of each. And this, is, this slide is really nice. And I think this summarizes it really well. So that when we talk about pharmacokinetics, we're going to be talking about plasma concentration and we're going to be talking about what affects plasma concentration. So there's a couple of formulas, okay? There's this formula here, which, which is the poly exponential function. And often you might see um, this one here, C to the exponent of minus C over T. Um, but the other one that you can also use is plasma concentration equals dose divided by your volume of distribution, okay? With the biophase, we've got the idea in terms of what changes your effect site concentration over time. And then finally, we've got pharmacodynamics, which is represented by this uh, sigmoid Emax model, which if you look at the formula here, you'll start to uh, see that it's got, a, it's got a lot of similarity with the um, michaelis menten equation which is where classical drug receptor theory uh, comes from. And it talks about receptor occupancy determining the, um, determining the effect. Whereas this one here is talking about concentration, but the ideas are the same. Now, well, let's explore and delve into each one a little bit deeper. Um, and then we can sort of understand how time course is affected from drug to effect. And I've just circled the really important ideas. So what's gonna be included is gonna be the dose, it's gonna be the distribution. I've circled elimination in red because that's something um, that I think that uh, has a minor role to play. So you don't wanna to spend too much time on it. Okay, and I'll explain the reasons why. Now we've also got transport to the biophase. So we need to understand what is going to be influencing the transport to the biophase. Um, we're going to be just quickly, briefly talking about um, the idea of how the drug binds to the receptor and the drug receptor interaction, which can sort of explain um, a little bit of the delay, the time delay, but obviously it's going to be a small component of it. You know, the major component is going to be this, these ideas here. Now, I just want to quickly point out this formula here. So this is the formula from Hemmings and Egan, which talks about the, um, the rate of change in the effect site. And they have K1E here. And we know that K1E is not really mentioned in, um, in many texts, but it is mentioned here in this book. And I think it is important for me to sort of go through that. And I will go through that in my, um, in my slides here today. And I hope that sort of gives you a sense of appreciation of why it's been included, but why it has not been included um, in other texts around. Now, I'm just gonna go back to my simplified model here. So we're gonna start off and we're gonna be talking about all the different factors that are gonna be affecting the time course between the dose, and the effect, which the effect is gonna be loss of consciousness. Now, we're gonna start off with um, the dose. In other words, how is it being delivered? What is being delivered, okay? And again, this is specifically for bolus dosing. 
And what I have here is just that, that uh, formula where the plasma concentration equals dose divided by volume and distribution. And remember that we can also define it as a poly exponential uh, function. Okay. Let's see. T. And the factors that are going to be affecting your plasma concentration is going to be your dose amount, your speed of injection. In other words, that the faster you give your, your set dose, the faster your rate of rise for your plasma concentration is going to be. And you should get onset quicker. Okay, but there is a caveat to this. So have a look at the diagram to the right here. And this was um, an experiment done by Ludbrook. And what they have here is you've got the same dose of propofol. So 100 milligrams of propofol at different rates of injection speed. So they've got 20 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. And the diagram, this diagram here, is looking at the plasma concentration. Uh, this diagram here is looking at the effect site. And what I think should come out is that when you have a very uh, quick injection or, or very fast injection, your plasma concentration peaks very, very quickly, okay? And then starts decaying very rapidly. But not where the peak is, it's very high. So you, so you reach your peak faster and it's a higher peak. Whereas if you were to give the drug over a longer period of time, your peak happens much, much later on. So you look at five minutes, it happens much later on and it happens at a much lower concentration. Now, what is really interesting, if you look at the effect side over here, so I think that the assumption always is that if you would give a drug really, really quick, so let's say 20 seconds, and you get a fast onset, your time to peak effect should be faster, but also your peak effect or your maximal effect will also be higher as well. But what is really interesting is that when you look at, um, so let's say you give a drug over 20 seconds. If you look at the 20 second one here, note that yes, the peak onset happens quicker, but it happens at a lower concentration versus something that's been given over a minute. So when you give something over a minute, which is over here, you reach a much higher peak concentration. And it does occur a little bit later versus the one over 20 seconds. And this gives you the idea that there are differences now between onset, time to peak effect, and also the idea of your peak effect or maximal effect that you can achieve. Now, the reason why that you get differences in the brain concentration versus the plasma concentration is that, remember that time to peak effect, and I'm gonna repeat this idea over and over again, is a function of both your plasma pharmacokinetics and your KEO. So this is really important. Time to peak effect here is a function of both plasma pharmacokinetics and your KEO. In other words, we know that, um, you know, propofol's time to peak effect should occur within uh, two minutes. And so if you've got, if you're delivering a drug very, very slowly, so much so that the peak plasma concentration happens at five minutes, you are not gonna get a time to peak effect of two minutes, if that makes sense. In other words, because of how your plasma pharmacokinetics is happening, where you're peaking at five minutes here, it means that your time to peak effect in your brain, if you look over here, is gonna be occurring much later on. So over here, it's occurring at, seven minutes here, around seven minutes. Okay, so it's occurring sort of down here. And this is, and this gives you the idea that time to peak effect, again, is both a function of plasma pharmacokinetics as well as KO.
and that idea is going to be repeated over and over again and that will host and that will hopefully help you understand some of the nuances of why you might get a um a ko number but a different time to peak effect Now, the other thing that's going to be affecting dose is your site of injection. And the assumption here with all these models here is that you get perfect mixing in V1. And so that when you draw your peak um, plasma concentration, it occurs pretty much at close to time zero. In other words, what I'm talking about is that if you've got CPT over time, what you have here is that you get the initial peak and then the decay. And this happens very close to time zero. In reality, there is an increased delay the further away you give it from the central compartment. So with peripheral venous administration, um, what happens is that there's what's called the idea of venous mixing. There's venous mixing, and then you also get uptake of the lung prior to entering uh, the central compartment of V1. And what you, what you will get is that, so if you were to give something peripheral, is that you will often get a much delayed CPT. Okay. And this idea here is explained with more sort of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic models and what they call recirculatory models. I'll show you an example um, in a couple of slides further on about uh, what these recirculatory models look like. I don't, need, I don't think you need to represent them in your answer, um, but I think they will help you appreciate some of the nuances and complexities of why some of these explanations you may not see occurring consistently in your everyday practice. Now, heading back to this simplified diagram here, um, I've talked about the bolus dosing. Now I wanna talk about the volume of distribution. And it's not just distribution into V1, but it's also talking about the distribution into V2 or the rapidly equilibrating uh, compartment. And this is going to be affected by your equilibration rate constant K12. Okay. Now, this again is for bolus dosing. So I haven't included redistribution, which is represented by K21. This is um, just solely for bolus dosing and just seeing what happens kinetically at the start. And so the things that affect your plasma concentration related to your volume of distribution is going to be anything that affects your weight. And we know by the Marsh model with increased weight, you increase your volume of distribution. We also know that age affects your volume of distribution. So that's described in Schneider with um, how it affects V2 along with the rate constants uh, K12 and K21. Those are the factors that affect um, the Schneider model and indirectly affect your volume of distribution. The third thing that affects volume of distribution is cardiac output. And I've put the reference there for Miller's on page 486 where they give you an example so in elderly patients with reduced uh, cardiac output, there is a reduced drug distribution and therefore there is an increase in the peak plasma concentration. Now, we can also talk about the idea that when we talk about peak, we're talking about how high it goes. The other idea here is the time to the peak, okay? So again, those are different concepts. We've got, we've got how high it goes, and then we've got time to reach that peak. In other words, you can have a much smaller peak, okay? So let's say you've got another drug that peaks over here, 
It's got a smaller peak, but it's got a longer time to reach that peak. And you can, and you can have different ways to describe it also where you can have a drug with um, a smaller peak, but it occurs a lot faster. So you can see that uh, there's different variations of these ideas, but it is important to make the distinction between peak plasma concentration and the time to reach that peak. And so in cardiac up, in sorry, in elderly patients with a reduced cardiac output, because they've got less volume of distribution, it's going to increase their plasma concentration. And you can relate that back to this formula here. Now, the other things that are going to be affecting it is going to be um, sex. And that's why you put in your sex for um, the Marsh and Schneider models, the percentage of muscle versus fat. And we can talk about, in fact, we've talked about that before with um, patients who are obese, the distribution of muscle and fat. And then we can also talk about it with pregnancy. So these are some of the ideas in terms of which you can expand on and which can be sort of talked about. And you can apply these concepts to understand how the plasma concentration changes over time with these patients. Now, this is a really confusing one, the role of cardiac output. And I've got a recirculatory model here. And this is uh, from Upton and Ludbrook. And let's just quickly follow it. So this is for thiopentone. And we are giving thiopentone, you know, peripherally. So, so via the injection site. And then we've got the idea, as I talked about before, about venous mixing. And then after that, it heads off to the lung before heading off into the aorta where it forms part of your cardiac output into V1. And this is, this is where distribution occurs. And you can see that distribution occurs into tissue pool one, tissue pool two, and then part of that cardiac output heads over here to the effect site. And we can see from this model here that your cardiac output is going to affect your distribution. So in other words, your cardiac output here is going to affect how much of it goes here and here, and that's your distribution, and that's represented as your plasma concentration. And then two, the other thing that you'll note is that it's going to affect how much heads off to the brain. So it's going to be affecting the delivery of drug to the effect site. And again, you'll see different models out there, but they've all got the same idea. Okay, so we've got um, dose here and you're heading into um, a delay. So that's um, a part of the distance between, you know, peripheral heading into V1. And again, they've got the idea of venous mixing, going to the lung, forming your cardiac output. And as it forms its cardiac output, part of it is heading to the brain. This one here, a little bit different, it's heading into the liver um, and then heading into the distribution uh, centers or distribution compartments as well. But again, same idea here. The cardiac output here is going to be affecting the transport of drug to the brain. In this diagram here, the cardiac output being transported to the liver is going to affect clearance. And then heading into these distribution compartments, that's going to affect your distribution. And you can see how cardiac output has such a big role to play. It affects not just, you know, your distribution, but it also affects how the drug is being transported to the brain.
and it's going to be a um it's going to be complex because i'll show you in a second if you increase your distribution you are going to be lowering your plasma concentration and if you lower your plasma concentration even though you're delivering the drug quicker to the brain you are delivering it at a lower concentration and that is going to affect onset as well as um, the maximal effect that you can achieve and there'll be a couple of diagrams i'll show you to explain that and that is a really interesting concept which you can actually see in your everyday practice so these are the two ideas here cardiac output cardiac output affects distribution and it also affects transport to the biophase. And I've given you an idea in terms of what the overall effect is, but let's delve into it a little bit deeper. And this was another study done by Ludbrook and Apton. And looking at the effect of different cardiac outputs and how they change your concentration at the effect site. And what I'll do is I will go through each of these graphs in detail. This is the first graph here. So it's a set bolus dose of um, propofol. And what should be obvious here is that you achieve a much higher plasma concentration as your cardiac output decreases. So with a low cardiac output, you have a much higher concentration versus a high cardiac output with a lower plasma concentration. And the reason for this is because cardiac output affects distribution. So low cardiac output, low volume distribution, higher plasma concentration. Higher cardiac output, higher volume distribution, lower plasma concentration. The really interesting thing about this is that this is for plasma it looks like um, the peaks so the time for the peaks are occurring pretty much at the same time but let's look at what's happening at the effect site so this is what's happening in the brain and what we can see is that for a lower cardiac output, you achieve a higher concentration in the brain. So your CET is higher. Okay, so your CET is here for a low cardiac output versus a high cardiac output where the CET is here. And remember, again, we're talking about, there's another concept here. So there's that peak effect or the peak concentration, but look at the time to get to the peak concentration. So in other words, with a high cardiac output, you get a lower brain concentration, but it occurs quicker than something with a low cardiac output where you reach a much higher concentration, but it occurs much later on. And I think hopefully that makes, uh, that makes sort of uh, sense to you when you look at things clinically, when you give, you know, a drug to a, to a shock patient or to an elderly patient, what you'll see is that it actually takes a little bit longer for them to get that peak effect. And if you happen to get your dosing, um, you know, if you happen to be to miscalculate your dosing, you can actually get a significant um overshoot of what you know what the level is that you require for onset to occur now the other idea which i also want to bring bring up to you is that um and we'll talk about this when we talk about ko in further detail but there's the idea about that onset doesn't need to occur at your peak concentration when we think about onset for propofol um, so loss of consciousness, the EC50 of propofol is around three marks per mil. And if you sort of look at here, sort of in, this one's in milligrams per liter, we would say that the onset would occur at this point here. 
okay? So that if you if I was to draw a line across here, what you can see is that for this, so it all it also remember that what I talked about in terms of you know onset and time to peak peak effect, it's also due to the the drug that you know the bolus drug that you give or the amount of drug that you give. So for whatever reason, this amount of drug that was given to this patient you can see that it was reaching the onset quicker, okay, versus someone with high cardiac output, which is happening at, at, at a much later point. So someone with low cardiac output is happening here. Someone with high cardiac output, it's happening sort of up here. And I know, and I know that's confusing, um, but this is where it's very, very conceptual because now we're talking about the delivery of drug or the amount of drug that's being delivered to the effect site. So remember that cardiac output, because of its effect of on distribution, it either increases the plasma concentration or decreases the plasma concentration. And then after that, you think about it in terms of transport to the brain. So it either delivers a very high plasma concentration or very low plasma concentration. And if the plasma concentration is high, there's going to be that concentration gradient between plasma and effect. And in this example here, with a patient with low cardiac output, because of that gradient, it has caused the onset to occur quicker. But for someone with high cardiac output, because that plasma, because um, of the, the reduction in plasma concentration, it's being delivered at a lower gradient. And that's why their onset is occurring much later on. In other words, the way to fix this is essentially to increase the dose or the amount you give in a patient with high cardiac output. And what it does is it fixes this problem. So with someone with high cardiac output, what you'll see is that this will occur. Okay, so let's say you give someone a much higher dose, this will occur. Okay, for someone with a much higher cardiac output. So by by adjusting the dose, you can actually adjust the onset. And the classical example for this is going to be pediatric patients. This is why in pediatric patients who have a much, not a much, but who have a higher cardiac output than an adult, this is why you increase your dose by 50% with those patients. Because if you were to keep your doses the same for those patients, this original diagram will occur, okay? Where they get their onset much later on. But by dose adjusting, you're able to take advantage, or sorry, understand that their high cardiac output is gonna be diluting their plasma concentration, but also knowing that this will increase the delivery to the brain. And by adjusting for that to allow that concentration gradient, that's where you can allow that onset to occur at a very similar time to someone with, you know, um, or sort of an adult with, you know, medium to high cardiac output as well. And then these are the diagrams for infusion. So I've just left them in here, even though we're talking about bolus dosing, just to sort of give you the same sort of um, examples here where for infusions, you have a much higher plasma concentration as your cardiac output decreases. And again, that idea comes from the idea that a low cardiac output decreases distribution. Um, and again, your plasma concentration peaks happen to be occurring at the same time. And again, same idea with the brain. So that um, if you have someone with a low cardiac output, you reach a higher peak plasma concentration. So your CET is higher, but your time to peak effect is later. So an increased cardiac output, what does it do? Number one, it increases your distribution. It reduces your plasma concentration and therefore reduces your effect site concentration. The other thing it does is that it increases the transport to the biophase, which means that you have a faster time to peak effect. 
And in the diagrams that I've showed you prior, the third thing is, is that there appeared to be a slower time to onset with them. I've put an asterisk on that because that has to do with the fact that those doses were not adjusted. And this is the important point here is that the dose has not been corrected. So, you know, for an adult, if you're giving one and a half to two milligrams per kilo in a child who has a much higher cardiac output, this would explain why their onset might occur a lot later, even though their time to peak effect occurs much faster. This is the complexity about cardiac output. It's really, really interesting. And I think it actually helps explain once you understand this concept about those differences that you see in clinical practice. Sam, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Yes, when? Uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to ask um, on just on that last point, if that's okay. Um, uh, you said there will be a slower time to onset. Is that correct? Lower so, time to onset, higher cardiac output for the same dose. So if if you haven't if you haven't dose corrected, and and I just want to so it's this idea here when is that when we talk about when we talk about onset of um a, let's say propofol here, when does onset occur? Um, wouldn't it occur at um at it, doesn't it occur at peak when the effect site concentration passes the threshold of um, LOC? Usually, I think it's two micrograms. Per yeah, meal. three. Yeah, correct. So we're saying that when it reaches three, yeah? So we yep. draw a line here of three. And which one of these lines crosses three first? All right, makes sense. Okay, okay, yep, yep. Um, the slow, the, the low cardiac output line. Yeah. And this is why it's really confusing. You ask yourself, why, why does the low cardiac output, why does it cross three first? Why do you think that is? Um, is it's because there has been a less mixing between the um, plasma and effect site compartments and that has led to a greater concentration gradient yeah, correct because it's because of the concentration gradient like you look at you look at the gradient that's occurring here because of that concentration gradient you get that push through and so therefore even though they're even though their time to peak effect is occurring much later on their onset is occurring faster okay in some of the low yeah. cardiac output but the caveat here is that this is for someone where you haven't dose adjusted. And so that if you were to dose adjust someone with a high cardiac output, in other words, you know, let's say pediatrics, um, what you should see is that you should see the onset occurring faster or, or at the same time, but the peak effect also occurring faster as well. Okay, does, does that make sense? So, so yeah, in this example here, I've dose adjusted. And the classic example is pediatrics where I've increased my dose by 50%. And because I've dose adjusted, what I'm doing now is that I'm maintaining that concentration gradient. So I understand that a high cardiac output is gonna be dropping my plasma concentration. And I wanna accommodate for that by increasing my dose so that I can maintain that concentration gradient across. Yep, that makes sense, thank you. And I suppose, is it fair to add a, a further point that in someone with high cardiac output, therefore, um, even um, the dose may not even be sufficient to induce loss of consciousness, is that um, Correct, so yeah, correct. If, if you, and, and that's, a, that's a good point, because if you haven't dose adjusted in someone with a very high cardiac output, and let's say hypothetically they're because remember that um three is ec50 so that's 50 percent. so let's say their loss of consciousness needs, needs to occur at four okay 
if you haven't dose adjusted, you can see that it doesn't, it never reaches four. And so you don't, and so that's why some patients, if you don't dose adjust and you'll see it, you know, those big muscly patients where you, where you still give 200 and they're still sort of conscious because you're not reaching that threshold in terms of where loss of consciousness occurs, even at the time to peak effect. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah really makes sense. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. good. Yeah, this one, it's a really interesting idea. These are ideas which are really good for the vibers because they really test your understanding. I think that for this written question here, I would not try to explain this in, in an SAQ answer. It takes too long. You can see that there's so many nuances to it, but it's a lot easier to explain um, across the table. So in a viva. Heading back to my uh, simplified model here, the question is how about clearance? So clearance is represented by this elimination rate constant, K1O. And I've got a paragraph from one of the um, articles by Ludbrook and Upton. So what they say is that removing hepatic clearance from the model caused only a minor increase in peak arterial propofol concentrations. And that makes sense because clearance does play a role in terms of removing the drug from V1. So it would make sense that if you were to remove clearance, that your plasma concentration is going to increase. But how much does it increase? You can see that it's only a small amount, okay? And its effect was similar for both dose regimes. Peak brain concentrations were altered by less than 4%, but the absence of hepatic clearance decreased the rate of elution of propofol from the brain and prolong the duration of anesthesia. In other words, clearance is more important for infusion than it is for bolus dosing. So that if you do want to add clearance into your answer, I would only put you know, a couple, maybe a line um, about it at the most, and also explain that it has minor effects or little effect in terms of increasing the plasma concentration and subsequently the effect site concentration. And I hope that answers the question about clearance and also why the examiner also did say in the exams report that uh, you know to limit the discussion uh, regarding clearance for this question here. All right, so we've talked about everything that's affecting the plasma concentration. Now we're going to be talking about the factors that affect transport to the biophase, um, which has to do with the time to peak effect. And remember from what I said before that the time to peak effect is both a function of plasma pharmacokinetics as well as KEO. So when we talk about the transport to the biophase and plasma pharmacokinetics, we're talking about cardiac output and specifically for intravenous induction agents, we're going to be talking about cerebral blood flow. In other words, if you increase your cardiac output, you're going to be increasing the blood flow to the brain, which is where the biophase is. The second thing is KEO. And this brings in the idea of the diffusible fraction through the blood-brain barrier. And that's based on Fick's law, obviously, because when we're talking about diffusion, um, we're talking about all the factors that affect diffusion as explained by Fick's law, but it doesn't include the concentration gradient. And this is what I was talking about before. And this is what um, was said with regards that if you were to increase your dose and you were to um, keep everything else constant, so your rate of injection, your cardiac output, increasing the dose, you would still reach your time to peak effect at the same time, okay? And remember that time to peak effect is a different idea to onset and is also a different idea to the peak concentration that you can achieve at the effect site. And so when we talk about transport to the biophase, um, KEO 
is primarily the one that is going to explain the delay or what they call hysteresis. And this is where we're going to talk about KO in more detail here. So looking back at this diagram here, we're going to discuss about KO. And then later on, I'll also tell you why we don't need to worry about K1E. So even though in this diagram, you're looking at K1E going, K1E represents the drug from the central to the effect site. It's going to play a role, isn't it? It makes sense, but I'll explain to you why it doesn't. So this important slide was in uh, episode six, and that is the slide where I talk about KO and the time to peak effect. And this is the golden rule. So when you increase the elimination of drug from the biophase represented as KO, that decreases its half-life as described by the relationship T half KO equals the natural log of two divided by KO. And that leads to a faster equilibration of the effect site with plasma. And what I mean by that, this is a really, really good graph. And this will be something that, that I think um, I would want to include in my answer for this question here. So this graph here explains that if your effect site equilibrates with plasma, quicker, it is going to be associated with a higher effect site concentration as your plasma concentration falls with time. And what I mean by that, so this is CPT as represented by this exponential decay. And what it shows you is that if you were to reach equilibration with the plasma quicker, is going to be associated with a higher effect site concentration. So in other words, with a higher KEO or with a higher elimination rate constant, otherwise also described as a equilibration rate constant, you are going to reach equilibration with plasma quicker, which means that you're going to be associated with a much higher effect site concentration versus something with a lower, so this has a KEO of 0.2, so something with a lower um, equilibration constant is gonna reach equilibration much later on. And because plasma concentration is falling, you can see that it's associated with a much lower effect site concentration. So I hope that makes sense to you in terms of how KO affects your effect site concentration with the time it takes to equilibrate with plasma. Because remember that plasma is not fixed. With a bolus dose, plasma is always changing over time. And so the question is, you know, why does a larger KO or a faster time to peak effect also correlate with a faster loss of consciousness described as onset with a bolus dose. And I've sort of touched on this before, but I'm gonna rehash this again, is that we need to think about loss of consciousness as a line in the sand. And in this diagram here, I've said that the EC50 of propofol for the loss of consciousness is at three marks a mil. So as soon as you cross that line in the sand, that's when you get onset. And in this example here, with a larger KO, which means that you reach equilibration faster, you are gonna cross that line in the sand a lot quicker. And that's why drugs with a large KO will reach onset a lot quicker versus drugs with a smaller KO. And in fact, you can even see in this example here, for, for this one here with a KO of 0 0.2, it doesn't actually reach that, uh, that line in the sand. And so for that drug there, because it's got such a, um, a long time to peak effect, 
that's where you run the risk of um, what we sort of call underdosing the patient. And just to highlight the differences between onset versus the time to equilibration with plasma or the time to peak effect. Different concepts, okay? So first concept is reaching that line in the sand, which is onset. Second concept is that time to peak effect. The third concept is the peaks at which they occur. And you can see they happen at all at different peaks. Okay. So peak CETs. So those, those are three different concepts um, in this diagram here. Now for drugs with a small KO, the way that you um, sort of accommodate that is that you have to increase the dose to increase the plasma concentration or the, co so you increase the concentration gradient in order to compensate so that onset occurs quicker. But the penalty for that is that your, your peak effect site concentration at the time to peak effect is higher and there's also a higher duration of action of the drug. And I've just superimposed um, this diagram here. So we've got this drug here, which has a very low equilibration rate constant or elimination rate constant of 0 0.2. And prior to um, the previous slide, I was sort of showing you that, that in that drug there, that never reached that line in the sand or that um, threshold where you get loss of consciousness. And so what you do with that drug is that you increase the dose so that now that it drops down like this. And with a KE of 0 0.2, you can see that what happens is that it crosses now the line in the sand here. Okay, so it happens much quicker. But the penalty you, play, you, you pay for that is that it reaches a much higher peak concentration at the effect site, okay? At the, time, at the time of peak effect, which occurs at the same time. And the other penalty you pay for is that the duration increases a lot longer. And this brings in the ideas about safety as well as um, the efficiency. So in other words, when we talk about um, safety, we want to make sure that we want to minimize the overdosing or underdosing of the drug. And in terms of efficiency, we want to be able to get to the onset quickly and also offset as well. And this is where the idea that uh, we have to balance as anesthetists those three things. So efficiency or onset, safety, which is trying to minimize under or overshoot because we know that um, they have significant effects. So if you undershoot, it means that you know, a patient has the risk of becoming aware. If you overshoot, then you've got the, all the issues about the pharmacodynamic um, adverse effects that an IV induction agents can cause. And then the third thing is making sure that it's efficacious. So we wanna make sure that the drug actually works. And the happy medium is balancing all those three. Okay, so this is the question that I get a lot. If more drug is eliminated from the effect site, why doesn't it lower the effect site concentration? In other words, if you've got a large KO, which is a large elimination rate constant, shouldn't that decrease your effect site concentration? It makes sense, doesn't it? The way to think about this is look at this diagram here. So you have to think about this as that the central compartment, which holds the plasma 
concentration overwhelms the volume at which the effect site concentration occurs. And it overwhelms it so much so that we can actually ignore the volume of the effect site. And so we don't even worry about the volume of the effect site. Now, the second thing, right, is that if we believe that an increase in your elimination rate constant decreases your effect site concentration, then we have to say that K1E or the transfer of drug into the effect site is fixed and independent of KEO. So what I mean by that is that if you have the effect site here and you've got drug that's going from V1 to the effect site at a constant rate of, you know, X milligram per minute, eliminating that drug or KO will obviously cause a shift in terms of what's happening at the effect site. And that would hold true if K1E was independent of KO. So in other words, they're not, they're not related at all. But let me show you a paragraph from Miller's, which I think will help you understand this idea. Kinetic micro rate constants used to describe the biophase include K1E and KEO. The K1E describes drug movement from the central compartment to the effect site. And KEO describes the elimination of drug from the effect site compartment. There are two important assumptions with the effect site compartment. One, the amount of drug that moves from the central compartment to the effect site compartment is negligible and vice versa. And the second thing is that there is no volume estimate to the effect site compartment. And I hope that helps you understand when you look at the previous diagram, if we are saying that the amount of drug that has to move from the central to the effect site. So in other words, if we are saying that the amount of drug that has to move from the central to the effect site is negligible, in other words, we can just say that it is zero. It doesn't really matter anymore. And then we're saying that there's no volume here. This is why K1E does not matter at all. And all we're looking at is KO for the modeling about when the effect site theoretically equilibrates with plasma. And to show you more proof of this, if you need more proof, have a look at Marsh and Schneider, which I'll show you in a second. Okay. They never have K1E listed. And so this formula here from Miller's, so this formula here describes the change of concentration over the change of time. This equals KO multiplied by your concentration gradient. This one here from Hemmings and Egan is the one that confuses everyone because it includes K1E. And I think that I understand why they put it in, but I think it ends up confusing everyone and trainees just want to talk about K1E, when we know that the previous assumptions that there's, you know, the amount of drug that, that moves across is negligible because the volume about the, uh, of the effect site is also negligible as well. And if you look at pharmacokinetic modeling, you'll see V1, V2, V3 movement from uh, K1 out. So that's uh, clearance distribution, redistribution, um, sorry, that's, sorry, this is distribution, and then this is redistribution, and then after that, we've got KEO. K1E is never listed in these pharmacokinetic models, and that is the reason why, and that's a very important concept to understand, is that 
the volume of the effect site is negligible, and therefore the drug moving from the central to the effect site is also going to be negligible as well. And just to summarize, what this means is that K1E is actually controlled by KO and therefore can be ignored. And this is another way to think about this. If you increase your equilibration rate constant, so you increase your elimination rate constant, what that means theoretically is that just think of it as just one whole throughput. If you increase your elimination, you're basically increasing the amount of drug you're trying to push in, into your effect site. And therefore, increasing your elimination or equilibration rate constant means that you equilibrate your effect site a lot faster with your plasma. And again, going back to this diagram here, I hope this makes sense to you in terms of why for a drug with a high elimination or equilibration rate constant, it equilibrates with plasma a lot quicker than something with a low equilibration rate constant, which occurs much, much later on. Okay, so that's, that is the difference in speed. And so KO influences your time to loss of consciousness, which is your onset, the peak at which they, at they occur. So your, um, the maximal or peak effect site concentration or your Emax. And also the third thing is your time to peak effect, which is when your effect site concentration equilibrates, equilibrates with your plasma concentration. Now, what factors affect KO? And Hemmings and Egan talks about a high diffusible fraction. And they have this idea here where they talk about small lipid soluble unionized unbound molecules reach peak effect site concentration more rapidly. And this is where um, it's related to Fick's law of diffusion. So that when we talk about the physical chemical properties of a drug, which determines its KO, they are related to molecular weight, lipid solubility, unionization, and protein binding. Now, I've just made a note here that there's a difference between the idea of diffusible fraction, which is the amount of drug that can diffuse across versus the amount that can't versus diffusion. Because when we think about the transfer of drug with the increasing concentration gradient as per fixed law, KEO does not appear to be affected by the concentration gradient. So very important for that. And this goes back to the idea that despite different dosing doses, if you kept everything else the same, you should reach the time to peak effect at the same time, okay? Because KO is not affected by your concentration gradient. Your onset can be affected, but not your time to peak effect. And then the other thing to also remember is that your time to peak effect is a function of plasma pharmacokinetics as well as KO. And I guess the way to sort of think about this is that, you know, when you, when you use TCI models uh, in theater, so you, you use your Schneider uh, model, and if you increase the doses or you increase your target uh, effect site or plasma um, site concentration, you increase the dose that you deliver. But if you have everything else fixed, the time to peak effect, which the model will calculate, will always be the same. So it doesn't matter whether you... Um, increase the dose or decrease the dose, KO is fixed. It's not affected by the concentration gradient. It's affected by all the physical chemical properties of the drug, which again is fixed as well, okay? 
this is the pharmaceutic side of things where it's all designed prior to actually delivering of the drug. Now, quite an interesting thing that you're going to ask me, or you're probably not going to ask me, but um, I'm sure when you look back at the notes, you're going to have a think about is this, the reduction in protein binding. Because let's go through the example of propofol here. So propofol has a molecular weight of 178 grams per mole, and that's pretty low. Um, it's got a very high lipid solubility. When you think about its um, degree of unionization in uh, plasma, it's more than 99%. But the thing about propofol is that it's got very high protein binding. It's got 98% protein binding. So you're going to ask me, you know, if you've got a plasma concentration of three marks per mil, how in the world can you actually get, you know, the same equilibration occurring at the effect site? Because 98% 98, 98 of that drug is being protein bound, so only 2% of it is being available. Now, I just want to, again, sort of touch on this, is that the idea about effect site concentration is 100% conceptual. Because remember that we cannot access the effect site. We do not measure concentration at the effect site. And the actual concentration that is being measured is being correlated with effect. So if you look at all these studies, they will have a desired outcome, which will determine what the effect are, what the effect is, and then they will plot that against the concentration. And the actual concentration in the actual effect site would have to be much, much lower than what is being, um, what is being shown due to the high protein binding of propofol. So that's a really key concept is that the effect site concentration is a conceptual idea. And that's why we can think about that as you know, having no volume and also that the drug that goes into the effect site is negligible as well. Now, what else? explains the delay or hysteresis. And this is the third minor one. And, and look, the, the large amount of your answers is gonna be talking about KO, but the third thing that explains the delay or hysteresis is the pharmacodynamics or the drug effect or concentration effect relationship. And that really is just simply the time required for the drug to bind the receptor. And in propofol, it's gonna be GABA A opening the channel. So allowing chloride to pass down its electrical chemical gradient and hyperpolarizing the resting memory potential. And that all, all occurs within, I would think, seconds or, or you know, probably less. But as part of that process, um, that also accounts for the slight delay between drug and effect, is that pharmacodynamic process of having that drug cause the effect. And this is described by this concentration effect relationship. Um, and that's using the Emax sigmoid model. And what we have here is um, gamma. So what, what is gamma? Gamma is also known as the Hill coefficient. I think some of you might have uh, sort of come across that in your textbooks. And the Hill coefficient describes um, how cooperative or the degree of cooperativity or interaction between the ligand and the receptor. And I believe that he'll actually, um, actually created that initially for hemoglobin and oxygen. And that just describes the steepness of the curve. Now, finally, I've got this table from Miller's, which correlates um, time to peak effect with the T half KO. And remember the relationship between T half KO and KO is that T half KO equals the natural log of two divided by your KO. So for a shorter T half KO, you're going to need a larger um, elimination rate constant or KO. And I think what you can sort of see from this table here is that in general, a shorter T half KO so the, the shorter T half KOs 
are associated with a faster time to peak effect, okay? Versus something that has um, a much higher T half KO, it's got a much longer time to peak effect. And classic example one here is going to be morphine, which has a T half KO of 264 and a time to peak effect of about 19 minutes. Now, the question that always gets asked is why isn't the T half KO consistent with the time to peak effect? And what I mean by that is that, look, we have an example here. So we've got the T half KO of 1.5 and we've got another one here of 1.5. And yet the time to peak effect is different. You've got one at 1 1.6 minutes and you've got one at two minutes. And in fact, you've got a TFK of 1.3, which is actually shorter. So Remy Fentanyl's TFKO is actually shorter than um, Thiopentone's TFKO. But Remy Fentanyl has a slightly longer time to peak effect than Thiopentone. So that is really interesting. And why is that? The reason for that. Remember what I said, that time to peak effect is not just a function of KO. It's also a function of plasma pharmacokinetics. So it requires to actually get an accurate calculation of what the KO is. It requires an integrated pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics approach. And this formula here, I think explains it really well, where when you look at measuring the effect, it's both a function of your concentration in the plasma, which is your plasma pharmacokinetics. And this is a convolution sign. So that's just a mathematical formula. It's just, it's not a multiplication sign. Um, and then it's also a function of what's happening um, in your biophase, where your biophase is described by KEO. And so therefore, when you look at the TFKOs for the sort of drugs, that's why it, there's no sort of consistency. They, you, you'll, you'll see some general um, patterns. In other words, a shorter TRFKO is associated with a faster time to peak effect, but you'll see some minor differences. And the reason for the minor differences is because of the differences in plasma pharmacokinetics. This is my structure. Um, I'm going to have, um, I'm going to think about it in terms of uh, time course. So factors that affect my plasma concentration or pharmacokinetics. So that's going to be, and I'm just going to list them, dose, speed, site, volume distribution, um, clearance. And I'm going to, I've just asterisk the clearance because um, I, I, I will note to say that this is only going to be a small component to it. And then the second thing that I'm going to talk about is the transport to the biophase. And I'm going to have to highlight that this will explain the delay so that this answers the second part of the question. And the main components of the transport to the biophase are gonna be cardiac output or cerebral blood flow and KO, where the majority of this answer is gonna be talking about KO. So KO being the equilibration of the effect site with plasma, and then the effect of KO um, on effect site concentration, time to loss of consciousness and time to peak effect. And then the factors that affect KO which are related to fixed law of diffusion, um, molecular weight, lipid solubility, ionization, protein binding, but not, not concentration gradient, okay? And then finally, just talk about the concentration effect relationship. Now, having to think about this, I will use, I will use propofol as um, an example, and, and um, I will draw the, the graph from Miller's, because when I, when I think about time course, I think it's really good to have a graph which shows how plasma concentration changes with time and also how the different KOs um, interact with that dropping plasma concentration after a bolus dose. And simple enough to do, I, I would keep my description of um, the drug through, through that, um, you know, just that compartment modeling. I would just keep it simple as that. I wouldn't use any of the recirculatory models. I think they're very complex and probably difficult to replicate for the, uh, for the short answer question. I'll probably draw somewhere that three compartment model. Important things are, got my pen. And apparently, you know, I, I, you're not allowed to have colored pens. 
So one of the things that I think is really important is that when we do our diagrams, um, we try to minimize the amount of lines that we draw into them. Okay. Um, I've got my paper, my papers here. Okay, let me just get up my screen. And stop the stopwatch. And again, lots of complex ideas here. I think the key thing is to make sure that, uh, you know, we try to keep things as, keep things simple because it's, there's so much complexity with this. And I think even with the simplest of ideas, it's still complex enough. Okay. All right. Let's, let's go. So what I'll say is um, for proper four, the EC50, for loss of consciousness is three mics per mil, and I'll put in brackets for loss of consciousness LLC. Now I want to talk about my time course first, and then after that, I want to talk about factors that affect my CPT. In my third page, I'll have factors that affect my CET. And the time course to loss of consciousness is a function of one plasma pharmaco kinetics, which I'll represent as CPT, two, the biophase, which I'll define as CPT, or KO, which explains the delay, and then three, concentration effect relationship or pharmacal dynamics. I'm going to draw my the graph from Miller's here. It's got time in minutes. 0, 10, 2, 4, 6, 8. I'm going to have my concentration in mics per mil, so zero, two, four, six, eight. I'm gonna have my graph come down like this to represent my plasma concentration. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have this one here. To represent CET with a KO of arbitrary, but we can say 0 0.8, and then we can just draw another one, which has much later on. This is a CET where the KO equals so 0 0.8. And the factors affect CPT. So CPT equals dose divided by volume of distribution or VD. Or you can also define it as or equals A to the exponent of minus of T beta exponent of minus of T plus C minus CT. And I think I'll actually draw my diagram here. So I'll draw my diagram as I drug to V1, K1, O, V2, V3, K1, 2, K2, 1, K1, 3, K3, 1, K1, E, perfect, and K, E. 
Oh. And then what I'll say is that you can, and so V1 has CPT. You can increase your plasma concentration by one, increasing the dose, two, decreasing the volume of distribution. And you can do that um, affected by decreasing the size of patient, increasing age, decreasing cardiac output, three, increasing your speed of injection, four, uh, your site of injection, and central more than peripheral due to more efficient venous mixing and five um, decrease clearance although minimally increases CPT more relevant for infusions okay factors that affect CT and explain the delay so delay is due to transport of drug to the biophase based on one cardiac output and cerebral blood flow and two t half ko which equals the natural log natural log of two divided by ko so if you increase your keo equals faster equilibration of CET with CPT, and I'll say refer to diagram on first page. This results in one increase CET or Emacs to faster time to loss of consciousness, which is three months per mil. And in actual fact, what I'll do is I'll just quickly go annotate this diagram before I forget. KEO due to properties of the drug increasing usable fraction from decreased molecular weight, increase lipid solubility, increase unionization, decrease protein binding and the time required for propofol to bind and open its receptors GABA A to allow chloride to pass and hyper polarize the resting memory potential also accounts for some of the delay albeit small all right with that
nine minutes and 15 seconds.